The Pali word that we translate as meditation, bhavana, actually means development. And it's good to think of training the mind as a kind of development of the mind. One thing, it reminds you that it's not something that happens only when you sit here with your eyes closed or when you're doing walking meditation. The mind can be developed at any time. And the exercises that develop the mind are not like the exercises for the body. For the body, you can do heavy exercise only for a brief period of time, and then you have to rest. But with the mind, the development of the mind can be timeless. You can get it all day long. Think of the basic principles of right effort. You try to prevent unskillful qualities from arising. If they have arisen, you try to get rid of them. You try to give rise to skillful qualities, and when they're there, you try to maintain them. Now this leads naturally to right mindfulness and right concentration. But those are things you can do all day long. In fact, they get better if you do them all day long. And John Fung's comment was that we tend to divide the day up into times. Time for this, time for that, time to meditate, time not to meditate, time to do something else. And it's true that we do have other things we have to do, but we can develop the mind as we're doing them. Which means that we have to keep restraint over the mind all the time. Now part of, the, part of us is going to rebel at the thought, because restraint sounds like straitjackets. We feel suffocated. But remember the Buddha's image. Household life is confining. The life going forth, the life where you can dedicate your life to the practice, that's the open air. Because the restraint here is basically to free you from all the unskillful things that drag you down. So it's good to see restraint as freedom and also as a strength. You're free not to think unskillful thoughts. You're free not to think the thoughts that after you've spent a day thinking them, you realize it was a wasted day. You've got the freedom of being able to look back on your mind in the course of the day and realize that you made good use of it. Most of us are like people who get supercomputers and then use them to watch cat videos. We've got this human mind. We can think all kinds of useful, amazing things. Yet look at the stuff that we spend our time feeding on. So exercise of restraint is a way of lifting the mind up to some of its potential. If you find that you're going out looking and listening and thinking about things that are going to be unskillful, you can ask yourself why. What inside you is doing the looking? The things that do the looking, the qualities of mind that do the licking, <coughs> excuse me, do the looking and listening and thinking. They get strengthened each time they get used. So here's an opportunity to strengthen your discernment. You realize that the things that clutter up the mind come from, with, from the senses. There's something you've never seen, never heard of, never thought of. It's not going to clutter up the mind. And even though there may be things that you've seen and heard of, thought of, 
way in the past. If, they, if you keep it way in the past, that minimizes the, the influence it's going to have. So look at your sensory processes as processes in cause and effect. You look in a certain way, what impact is it going to have on the mind? Who's doing the looking? Which part of the mind is getting strengthened by the looking that way? The Buddha doesn't say you don't look, you just learn how not to focus on the things that are going to stir up greed, aversion, and delusion in the mind. Now, lots of things you can look at in the world, lots of things you can listen to, lots of things you can think about that don't stir up unskillful qualities. You're totally free to range around in those topics. Although it is true that you are putting some restraint on the mind. It's like the restraints on either side of a canal. If water is spread or out over a countryside, it's not all that strong. But if you channel it into one canal, the current can get very strong. It's the same with the mind. You can channel the mind into thinking about things that are really useful. And you find that it has a lot more strength if its strength isn't scattered out. There's an image in the canon, the mind that's thinking about the different hindrances. It's like a river course where openings have been made in the side of the river course. So that the current is not very strong. But if you close off those openings, the current in the main water course gets strong again. So when you want to think about skillful things, you really do have to turn off the unskillful ones. That means not only turning off the thoughts, but also turning off your habits of looking at things in unskillful ways and listening to things in unskillful ways, engaging the senses in unskillful ways. Because those deplete your strength, they waste your time. Otherwise, you sit and meditate and the mind settles down, and as soon as the meditation session is over, you throw it away. It's as if the concentration was something in your lap, and as soon as you get up from the seat, it's fallen off. One of the first rules of meditation is when you leave meditation, don't fully leave it. Try to maintain as much of the concentration as you can as you get up, walk away. After the evening session, go back to your place and see if you can pick up where you were. When I first went to stay with Ajahn Phu, he arranged to have some evening meditation sessions. There were a couple of new monks there at the time. I was one of them. And that was one of his first pieces of instruction, is don't meditate only during the evening session. You want to make progress, you carry the meditation with you. Of course, carrying it with you means restraint. A lot of things that you can't think about because they would destroy the center that you've been able to develop. Well, have a sense of the value of this center. And remind us of what freedom of thought means from the Buddhist point of view. You're free to think skillful thoughts, and you're free to not think unskillful thoughts. Because in that way, your, your thinking becomes useful. So look at the practice as an all-day affair. You're developing your mind all the time. You're exercising the mind all the time. And as you do, it builds up momentum. And when you're really focused on maintaining the state of your mind, a lot of the issues that tend to come up when people live together just don't have time to come up, because you've got other more important things to do. Remember, the bottom line here at the monastery is not the 
monthly budget over there on the, on the bulletin board. The bottom line is, how are you training your mind right now? How are you using your time throughout the day? So learn to look at restraint not as confinement, it's the open air. It's a channel leading you to something really good. You feel a little tight sometimes because you, you're trying to channel the water of the canal so it goes really fast and flows really strong. But then you can think about it. What can be done with really strongly channeled water? There are places up in the Sierras where they had these enormous hoses. They would take the water out of the streams and they would funnel it into these hoses, and they could wear away whole hillsides of granite just with the strength of the water, because they had it focused. If you happened to touch the column of water as it came out of the hose, it would burn your hand. So even though restraint does require that you say no to certain things, and you're placing a fence around the mind in certain ways, but the placing of limits actually focuses your strength. And as I said, we've got this amazing mind that's capable of a lot of things. But we don't get much use out of it because we just let it wander around aimlessly. When you exercise restraint, you've got a clear sense of priorities, a clear sense of values. And you stick with them. You focus your thoughts on things that really are helpful. And don't waste your strength on things that would pull you away from the practice. So see a restraint, both as a kind of type of freedom and as a strength. When you have the right attitude towards the practice of restraint, then you give yourself to it with your whole heart, and your whole heart will benefit.